What up, bro? What up, bro? And welcome to Bro Meets World. What is Bro Meets World? Your boy Meets World fan cast, episode 66. Ayo. I'm Siege. And I am uh, TC. Ayo. And we're back. Sorry, it was a little bit of the holidays, but we will keep it moving. With you know the- what? Sorry, not sorry. Guys, <laughs> we need a time off to celebrate the holidays. We got Christmas. We got Hanukkah, and of course, the big one, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. So, you know, we just need the time to make sure we were observing all of these holidays properly. And yeah, I'm not sorry that we took some time for ourselves, self-care. It's self-care. 20, it's 2020. We shouldn't have to apologize for this <laughs> any longer. Uh, are you ready to get into this week's episode? Yeah, you know what, Siege? I am, because I have some opinions as to why this episode, I think, is probably the most, like, I think this episode changes the tide more than any episode this season so far. Interesting. I'm really excited to get into that. All right, so uh, let's start off with some Tell Me About It. Tell <laughs> 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 Guys, it's been a while. <clears throat> Tell me about it. Tell me all about the show. Don't think I didn't notice that key change. <laughs> like, you gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta know, you gotta know your limits. Okay, this is season three, episode 20, I Never Sang for My Legal Guardian. Jonathan decides he's finally ready to assume responsibility as Sean's legal guardian, but Sean only wants to be with his father, Chet. Corey and Topanga search for Chet, but Corey becomes distracted when he catches the attention of a woman. In a B storyline, Mr. Feeney strong arms Eric into tutoring the, the school star athlete, Jeff, who we have never heard from and will never hear from again. <laughs> uh, that is us. That's where we're at. Yes. Okay, so what were your first thoughts of this episode? Um, I love a chat episode. I love a Chet episode Got because to. they're complex. Yes. Any episode with Chet is just one where you really learn more about Sean. A hundred percent. And the the show almost always, I don't think there's ever been an episode with Chet that it hasn't nailed. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, it's just whatever story they're trying to tell with this this tornado of a character, he they they nail it every time. And I'm so glad as a viewer that we're finally getting Chet coming back to Philadelphia and being a part of the show. Because as you've mentioned, like, we've never learned more about Sean than when Chet's in, involved in the story. And yeah. you, you know what? As an actor, he, he is bringing so much to the plate that uh, no matter how... And no matter how many mistakes he makes, you're always rooting for him. And I think we say this every time yeah. Chet's on screen. Every time Chet is on screen, you're like, you are the most lovable destruct- destructive force. Like, that's... Chet does a lot of things in this episode where I'm like, really, dude? Yeah. Really? But as far as like someone to watch, he plays it perfectly. Totally. So, um... That leads us to our roll call because uh, I I kept Blake Clark, who plays Chet Hunter, up here mostly because, again, I just want to talk about Chet a little bit. You know what what I love about um, Blake Clark specifically? I think he has an amazing voice. He does. Like, if you just kind of close your eyes and listen to him talk, there's so much character in there. Um, I think that Chet, um, you you know, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, Jim Verney, who did the voice for Slinky Dog um, in Toy Story, um, he was also, you know, Ernest. Yeah. Um, he passed away, and they actually asked Blake Clark to come in for the third ah. movie and do the voice because they're so similar. That makes and, sense. And, you know, when you listen to him talk, he just has this kind of, like, southern, charming, old man. Yes. Qual- I don't know. There's something about the quality of his voice that has a, a story behind it, even when he's not telling one. Absolutely. We were talking about it earlier, but I was saying how... Uh, aware I am of used car salesman and Chet is that used car salesman where you're like you're gonna sell me something like I don't like I I know I shouldn't but the moment you opened your mouth I was like you charming son of a bitch I'm gonna walk out of here with something totally <laughs> and that that's who his character is we also get uh Bobby Phillips as Luann um 
who is the other waitress who does Topanga's hair and who... Oh, you mean the one who flirts with underage Corey? Absolutely. Right, we can circle back to that. <laughs> um, we get Bobby Jacoby as Jeff, um, who I'm not really sure... Is that the athlete? Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, yeah, Jeff yeah. the athlete. Um, I did not recognize him from anything else. Absolutely. That's why I was like, but the name Bobby Jacoby, I don't know. It's just, mm. I mean, it's not a great stage name, no, but... Not, maybe that's why he, <laughs> we don't know him. Uh, and then we also get Cindy A. Laura as Anita. Anita, Anita, Anita. I think she's just one of the girls at school. Hmm. Oh, was that the one that sat on Eric's lap? Yes. All right, all yeah. right. Now we're getting somewhere. So, um, that do, speaking of Eric and Jeff, do we just want to get into the B storyline? Like yeah, Kendall? sure. Yeah. All right, so we get this whole thing where... It's a. Uh, it's shown that Feeney sets Eric up as a tutor because he assumes, or at least the episode lets us believe that Feeney thought this way. But it turns out Feeney was like, I don't know, maybe I, I took a shot in the dark. But it was like one of the ways that they thought Eric might learn and do better on his own test was by teaching someone else. And I will say that's a method that, from what I know, works really well it's like in order to understand something sorry in order to explain something you have to understand it yourself totally and what i really love about this is that um as you've mentioned like feeney didn't quite intend for that to be the outcome but he just kind of got lucky but i think that just speaks to the fact that like even that michael jordan can sink a shot that he didn't aim to sink you know what i mean and just that that still just speaks to the quality of educator that feeney is um, I think that by Eric being frustrated by someone who was refusing to learn, um, it was a fun thing for Feeney to do for him so he could maybe feel some of Feeney's frustrations. Absolutely. Um, but I also think it's just really interesting that this is the first time that Eric starts to believe in his own uh, ability to... I don't know, study and to pass a test. And I, I, there's been like... We've had, I think this time, it may have been this episode last season, where he had the uh, female tutor I thought who the didn't same think thing. he was smart. Yeah. And he was like, I'm like, I'm smart enough to not cheat. And like, you don't believe in me. And like, I, you know, someone has to. Uh, so I don't know if this is the first time, well, but I will say I I like this this arc with Eric, I just wish it was consistent throughout the season. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I, I I, do think this is, does support Eric's overall story arc of trying to get into college and trying to do better with his grades and him trying to find any reason to do better in school. But it comes and goes is what I'm saying. Oh, like, it's, it's super inconsistent. It's very inconsistent. But as I would think a senior in high school would kind of be like, <laughs> I want to go to college, but I'm also trying to have a girl sit on my lap in a Porsche. This so. week I'm in, this next week I'm out. Also, Jeff taking bribes i mean like or is it just one of those yeah he's like there's no reason why he should be this far ahead in school exactly this is what i'm saying this guy can't read (laughs) this is what i understand so yeah i was just like what is our situation here also this is going on at feeny school that doesn't seem right no because feeny doesn't seem like the type of person that would allow some shit like that absolutely so so just like just a little hold a little nitpicks that i had with this whole thing um but was there anything else really special about that that you want to point out? Um, not, not really. Um, I, I thought the storyline was pretty, pretty typical of a normal Boy Meets World episode in this season. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to see, oh, also Eric gets an A, um, and he gets his first A, it seems. Well, that's, that's part of the reason why I was saying that, because I think in the last season's tutor episode, when Eric was working with the female tutor, he had this confidence of, like, I want to... I want to do it myself even if I fail. And I thought that this was more so him saying like, oh, wow, like maybe I won't fail if I just really try. Um, uh, my whole thing is he didn't, and I don't disagree, I'm just saying that he didn't expect the A. You no. know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah. Like he, it's not like he was like, I studied really hard for this A and I got it. It was like, oh, 
you made a mistake here. You never told me what letter grade I had. It just says A. Yeah, it's just like no, but that's, that's kind of what I like about it. I like that when Eric wasn't trying to pull one over on someone. Yes, okay. He inadvertently taught himself. I mean, but that's kind of like him and Feeney's whole deal. You know, yeah. it's just like getting Eric to learn in ways that Eric doesn't realize he's learning. But that and that's what makes Feeney such a great educator. Like him taking Eric to the opera and understanding, like, hey, if you want to flirt with smart girls, this is how you can. Yes. Do it. Like, doing it in a way to where it's receptive to Eric is something that I think Sphini is just going to continue to be better at. Um, and that's really all I have to say about that storyline. I thought it was pretty basic. Yeah, okay. Um, moving on. Chet. We're back to Chet. And, well, let's start with some Jonathan yeah. and... Uh, Eli? Eli. Yes. Well, well, okay, so I wrote, just as a really quick a note of mine, I was like, Eli can do better. We've never seen it. He has, like, no sexuality Really, why don't we ever give Eli, like, like he should have some interactions, you know what I mean? Like, give him a life outside of just being Jonathan's pal, who's not even there constantly. I gotta say, this was the episode where Eli popped in where I was like, wow, you are officially useless, yeah. I think, in the show. <laughs> because if your only role is to be the support system for Jonathan... While he has Sean. Now that Sean is gone, you don't have a role. Absolutely. Um, and that kind of will lead into my other well, thing I want to talk about. Where we're going. <laughs> we're the, but I do think it was quite interesting that we saw that Jonathan was just as nervous to take on Sean as you know, um, Sean was to agree to be lo- long term with Jonathan, to look at the condo, to look at another place to call home. They both had reservations for it, and I, I don't actually think it was fair the way that Sean reacted towards Jonathan, um, but he's a child, whatever. But what I think was really telling more than anything was just the fact that um, Turner had these papers for a while, and he just didn't know when was the right time. I love it, because I wrote that, first of all, the idea that Chet sent the paperwork to adopt Sean without telling... Without telling Sean. Yeah. You know, we've seen him speak to Sean or leave messages or whatever. He never once mis- he never once mentions it to Sean. On top of the fact that we find out later, he's not too f- he's like a car ride away. He's he's avoiding coming back, is exactly. what we Exactly. And I was like, oh, dude, come on. Like that's a whole other thing. But on top of that, I feel like the show shows that they both have very valid reason to feel the way that they do. Like, no one's really wrong in their behavior. Jonathan was like, hey, I did this thing kind of be to be a good guy. I like our living arrangement, but, like, do I want to do this long term? And uh, remind you, Jonathan is young, and it's like, oh, I just adopted this teenager, and he's just my responsibility for the next two years? That's a lot to put on him, and it, and it does take some thought. And I wish we had gotten Eli, if he's going to be there, to have like a scene or even a few episodes where Eli and Jonathan are just talking about, hey, I got these papers. I don't know when to break it up. Or, sorry, when to bring it up. And I just, honestly, I don't know if this is something I want to do. I kind of don't. I I mean, I don't blame Turner for thinking about it. I think it was very telling to where he is in life. But at the same time, he has no idea when Chet's going to come back. Chet don't know when Chet's going to come back. Like, this is all just so open-ended. Also, we know, like, uh, again, later on, we find out that Chet has come back. So the idea of, like, oh, well, I don't know when he's going to come back, the answer was never. And that, like, I don't think they both kind of knew that. And signing the papers was giving Chet an easy out. And it's interesting how Sean never thought of it that way. That he never thought of sending those papers as meaning something as significant as it is. And that by his dad just sending this paperwork, he was basically saying, like, I don't want you in so many ways. Well, I mean, as you pointed out, Sean is young. He's 16. And it makes he's going to rebel against the authority. And at this particular time, Chet made it to where... Jonathan's the authority, so Chet just gets to be the good guy. Yeah. Like, and Chet's the one who's looking for his wife. How could you be upset with that? I'm trying to find your mother. I'm across town. I'm telling you all these great stories. And Sean, not knowing that he's in town, <laughs> is just like, oh, okay, well, 
my dad did what he had to do. And even and you know what? When Sean does find out that his dad is like a few hours away, he doesn't even bother to read the letter. He like immediately calls it out. And you can sense that Sean has been having this growing frustration that the people in his life are not taking his circumstances seriously. I mean, they're we're, not. The show barely does. And he <laughs> and he has to like constantly remind people like, hey, I am not living with someone who's family. I am I've never I can't remember the last time I've been in a home that was permanent. Like, understand what this is like for me. If I tell you, as my best friend, that I want to go live with my uncle because I want to be with family, you should be supportive of that because I have no family with me right now. And again, it's one of those weird things where it's like, I don't really disagree. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's... Especially if you have family that is close by. I mean, in all fairness, Sean's family... We've seen. Well, the trailer was gone when he went there, so he ended up sleeping in the park. So, I yeah. mean, Corey, I guess, had some right to be suspicious of Uncle Mike, who we've met a few times. Um, but, no, I just... I, I, I'm saying that Sean really has been through the ringer, and I really don't feel like the people in his life have shown him the kind of support he needs. And I'm saying that the desire... There's nothing wrong with that desire to yes. want to be with family. yeah. Uh, he is right to do so. He has been living with Jonathan for almost a year. Um, he stayed with the Matthews before that. Exactly. But point being is, he's 16 years old at this point in time. Yeah, that is like still that. 14 years of like having a family unit that you know is right down the street and you just don't see them as often. And you don't have that support system. You're constantly in someone else's space, constantly checking yourself and making sure that you're being polite or that you, you know, whether it was with the Matthews. And just feeling like a puppy or, that just gets passed around. Absolutely. You know? um, and so it makes sense that he felt this way. I liked that they're... They're both afraid to make the arrangement permanent. And what something else that I thought was really interesting was how this show used Chet to talk about the insecurities that men face and the insecurities that, um, I don't want to say poor, but like lower class, lower class. people face yeah. in regards of like... Lower income. Lower income, yeah. And in and, and the sense that like, Men, especially of Chet's age, were told probably their entire life that your job and your responsibility is to raise a family and support a family. Yeah. And he has not been able to keep a job. He can't keep his family together. And he he doesn't even have the money to leave the rest stop he's at. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where, of course, he feels like he's not in a position to be a parent. Of course, he feels insecure. How can I do right by Sean when I've never done anything right? Yeah. It's it's one of those things where like of course you're better off like Sean's better off with his his dad, but as an adult, I can understand Chet a little bit more than I did as a child. Absolutely. I think there is there one of the problems is Chet tries to have it both ways. Yeah. He tries to remain the fun loving, carefree dad who's on a man on a mission, but then also not have any of the responsibility that comes with being Sean's guardian, and you need to, if that's how you feel, you need to literally hand that over and be man enough to hand that over. And the fact that he doesn't, that he tries to ease his way out of it is what makes the situation worse. Yeah. You know, it's like he never went to Turner and was like, hey man, I honestly can't do this. And Sean is way better off with you. And, you know, and, and I, the show does a great job of showing how. Uh, Chet has used this pursuit of Verna as like a scapegoat. Absolutely. As like, if I'm doing this, I'm doing something that's romantic. I'm doing something that's for my family without having to be, uh, do the things I know I'm not good at, which is keeping a consistent job and living situation for my family. Absolutely. Do you, did you ever see uh, Breaking Bad? Yeah, yeah. All right. So like, again, there's that whole lie that Walter White tells himself, where he's like, I'm doing this for my family. Yeah. And there just comes a point in time where you're like, no, this isn't for your family anymore. Sure. You know, and even he gets to the point at the end where he's like, I did it because I like well, it. Well, you know what? I think the, the the key difference there is that, you know, with Walter White, you're getting, like, greed and, like, ego that comes into, into play. Whereas I feel like the opposite is true of Chet, which is that his self-esteem is so low that he just genuinely doesn't trust himself well, to I be... Uh, at least my argument with it is that this is still for Chet. Yes. You know, it's yeah. still a selfish act. To like, protect himself. To, absolutely. And it's there's no consideration for not only Sean, who we know, but any of his children. 
Because as we learned both this season and in future seasons, he has other kids out there. And you know what? I'm sure with this year on the road, Chet probably has fathered some <laughs> other kids we don't know about. Absolutely. Uh, there's probably a Facebook group of Chet's children. You know what I mean? And I, I don't have a problem with that. I think, A, it would, if this was a modern storytelling uh, I feel like we would go in more depth about that. I actually think they kind of approach this in a modern way. Because I feel like in, a, in, in some shows that I've seen um, in the 90s, 80s, whatever, Family Ties, Fresh Prince, there's you could very easily make the dad just an enemy. You could just make him a bad guy. Absolutely. And you can give him a drinking problem, which Chet has. You can give him a gambling problem, which, which Chet, Chet has. <laughs> you can give him all these things, but for them to say, no, family is messy, and sometimes you love this flawed person even though they're flawed, is such a huge thing for a fucking kid show to be like, let's explore this, and let's not make light of this fact that Sean loves his dad, regardless of his shortcomings. Uh, yeah, again, I think for me, it was more of like, I feel like we would get deeper into this, but I, I completely agree with you. Oh, for yeah. the time that it came out, this show does amazing. Even showing, we see three people be, three men be vulnerable, as yeah. you pointed out. We have Jonathan being like, I don't know if this is the thing that I want to do with the rest of my life, and I'm kind of hesitant, and I'm scared. I'm like, literally, I, I don't know if I want to commit. And then, which has always been my issue, you have Sean being like, hey, you're not my real dad, and I know that's cheesy, but that's just kind of how I feel, and I'd rather be with someone else. And then later on, when Sean is talking to his father, he's being very vulnerable yeah. in a way that most male characters don't get to be, especially with their fathers. The The scene with Sean and Chet at the police station I thought was so fascinating because... One, you're seeing how, um, you know, this is a generational thing of getting arrested. Yeah. And, like, what that can do to a family to be in and out of the crime. Because as soon as Chet sees Sean, he, like, gives him, hey, when you're, whenever you're in the police station, you want to make sure to do this, this, and that. As if to say, I've been in so many police stations. Follow my lead. I'll get you this out is, of here. This is how I, this is what I pass on to you. Yes, which is just terrible. Um, and then you have this amazing scene where you see Sean, like, ask like legit just say dad i you need to stay like i need you here that's what and I'm he saying. didn't have to do that chet could have just been like you're better off here and sean could have just nodded and just been like okay but he didn't do that and i feel like had he been talking to turner or feeney he would have just said everything's fine and walked away no no i agree and i love i love that scene for a few reasons one it's heartbreaking because i wrote in this note that the very first time we see chet this season since the thing is with Corey. Yeah. Corey sees Chet first. And I was like, that, I am offended. I am heartbroken and offended for Sean. The fact that Corey gets to see Chet before Sean does. Yeah. That's really, really upsetting. Additionally, Chet doesn't come there for Sean. No. Chet ends up there. And this is, this is a very clear situation where had fate not intervened, they would never have this moment. Because Chet would never have had the balls to face Sean. He never or or Turner. And yeah. he it's he runs into Sean and Turner. Yeah. And they both do their best to just take him for who he is and move past it. Um and that says a lot about these two characters and the show. That, you know, no one really harps on him and no one really drives Isn't him out, it but... interesting that Chet's journey was to find Verna who was running, but actually what was happening was Chet was running. Absolutely. And Sean's journey was to stop Chet from running. Uh, well, I, again, so what I love about that is he says, did you find mom? And he goes, oh, I, I saw her a few months ago. So, yes. She yeah, jumped but... off a boat rather than see me. A <laughs> river boat. Also, I found her. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I, I was chasing her, you know. She no, saw me. She just didn't she saw, stay. she saw me. I saw her. We saw each other. And yet, I never came back and was like, hey, I saw your mother. And and Sean asked that question. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, that means a lot. And then on top of that, you have him saying, as you said, he didn't have to say this. I think what is important for you right now is to stay. Yeah. And what it's what I need and it's what you need. To just be, stop running and be here. 
There's a really amazing scene. And, you know, the show is a traditional 90s sitcom. There's not really, I don't think there's really close ups. Like, I think they shoot everything pretty middle and mid and wide. Uh-huh. Um, but there's this fantastic scene in the police station where uh, Chet says to Sean, I'm going to give you something I haven't given you since you were a kid. And he gives him a hug. And it's such a shame that we're kind of in this rigid sitcom format because if you pause, you can see that Ryder Strong's acting is phenomenal in that moment where he's giving him a hug and Sean's face is almost bewildered. Like, I don't know what's happening right now. And you only get a glimpse of it and then they kind of cut to the next scene. But had that been like a modern family type of filming technique, you you would have got that long hold on Sean's face and Ryder really just emoting everything that Sean's feeling so beautifully. Um, I just thought that was just such a great scene that I I wanted more of. Um, Yeah, that that scene is great. Um, And I think it's because of that vulnerability. Yes. And the, the, the turning of Chet deciding to stay. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like those two things right there really make this episode. Uh, Chet's conversation with Corey earlier in the diner is another thing where I was just like, I was floored that Chet was just kind of being honest and being a human, like, like being a lovable bad guy, yeah. which we have talked about, but like, this is Chet at his chettiest where he is saying all the things where you're like, I, I hate you for doing this to your son, but I also see your humanity. Well, and Chet, I mean, let's not give him all these passes because, let's be real, he is consistently playing the victim. And I think it took Sean being like, no, Dad, like, you gotta do this. Like, you can't keep finding excuses for this. Well, he says, one of the things that he said, again, like, offended is, he goes, there's nothing in this town for me. And I'm like, you said that to your son who's here. And Sean says, I'm here. Yeah. And it's just like, again, it's like... It's painful, but as you were saying earlier, I think what makes this great is you understand Chet. Yeah. You don't like anything about it, but you understand the insecurity. You understand the unpreparedness. Yeah. The the anxiety. You know, it's like this there's this sweet talking, lovable social dude. But when it comes to anything that's, like, real responsibility, Chet knows that it's, he's all talk. Sure. You know yeah. what I mean? And you know what? I That's one of the reasons why um, – I'm sorry to go back to this for a second. Yeah, but with uh, Eric's storyline, it really didn't mirror the journeys that the other three men, Chet, Turner, and Sean, were going through. And had yeah. that mirrored it where – Eric was feeling some trepidation about taking a big leap or not feeling like he knew his place. I feel like this episode would have been far more cohesive because the journeys that the other three men are taking are so interesting. And like I said, like changing the foundation of what this show becomes. Yeah. Because... Can I hear that? Because like, let let me know this. this Yeah. So, you know, from what we've seen, uh, you know... I like to think of Boy Meets World as, like, four different shows. Or yeah. Three different shows or whatever. <laughs> so the first season, we had this family dynamic, right? Yeah. And basically, from the time these kids stepped into high school, by the time, from they, when they met Jonathan Turner for the first time, yeah. until this episode, the show shifted into something else. It shifted into Happy Days. It shifted into We're at School... We are, you know, running into daily events with students, blah, blah, blah. It all just, you know, you have Frankie, you have Joey, you have these, like, cast of misfits. It's very school-based. Yeah. Ignoring the family element of the first season. Absolutely. As if it never happened. As if it never happened. I mean, can you, can you remember the last time that Amy and Alan really played a significant role in the season? Like a significant one? No. Or even Morgan having a storyline that wasn't just her walking in with the... A quip? Like, no. it, it's, it hasn't existed, right? Yeah. The reason being was that there was only so much room for mentorship on the show. Yeah. And when Jonathan came in, he took that away from the parents. Very true. And he took that away from not only Corey's parents, but from Sean's parents, too. Now that Jonathan is no longer in care for Sean, the storyline then moves into this beautiful perfection of boy meets world which i think is the next two seasons really but this merger of everything that made the first show great 
the family elements with all the school stuff that made the second one great. By taking Jonathan out of the equation, because Jonathan is essentially fucking done. Like, <laughs> I know that he, like, technically, like, he, he's, he's, in, still he's here. in next season, he has a motorcycle accident, and then he dies, but he doesn't die. But I'm telling you, he essentially dies right now. Spoiler because alert. There's, there's the relationship that he has with Sean is his main storyline. Yeah. It's taken away because it's replaced with Sean and Chet, which yep. is better. Um, Corey starts talking to his parents more. Parents getting involved. The parents have their own storyline next season. Alan changes his career. Like it's I a whole do remember thing. that. I, I, I will say I don't remember all of the later episodes, but I'm kind of, uh, and we can talk more about this during our season wrap. Yeah. But I do remember we get more substantial moments with Amy and Alan, uh, and more like like heart to hearts with the kids. And I um, think the other thing is that. Without Turner being involved as much, Feeney steps back in as the Feeney that we know, which is that he gets all these wonderful opportunities to have these teaching moments. Yeah. Um, telling Sean to get tickets to the Super Bowl, things like that, to where like, oh, God, there's there's so much room for these other characters to grow when they take Turner out, and I feel bad because Turner played such an amazing po- like part in these last two seasons, but I really feel like. What it once helped the garden grow is now hurting the the garden, and it's they removing really, it is helpful. I love that you say that because I was going to ask you, and again, maybe we can go more into this when we do our season recap. But I was going to say, based on that, do you think Jonathan kind of held the show back with that decision, and they rightfully course corrected? No, because I feel like the show needed to learn. The, the, the certain saying. elements that they figured out in these last two seasons with school figuring out, like, how the kids, what they're learning in the day-to-day can affect their the decisions they make with their relationships and their friends. Um, and I, I, I think the kids maturing takes a big part in that, too. Next season, Sean's helping a girl who's getting abused by her dad. Like, there's a bunch of, like, adult things that these more mature kids can now handle without needing that middle person to talk it out through between their parents and their teacher and, and Feeney. So Absolutely. Well also I think that what they did, I think it was right and truthful that at this age you stop relying on your parents. Yeah. And you start to seek advice from just older individuals, people who you admire. And Turner came in as one of those individuals. So it made sense and then him and Sean living together, it, it seemed like it would be a source of learning from his mistakes, which we do like in a few episodes where yeah. we see Turner make adult decisions that the children reflect on their own lives and, and just kind of think about the adults they want to become, but they never really lean into that. Yeah. And that, that never really takes off. So learning to mature the content, but put it in a sort or put it with source materials that they really have to formula down I think, I think you're right. And I think the show does a great job of realizing when a character isn't helping the overall story, which is how Minkus left, which is how <laughs> Harley left, which is how, uh, you know, Jonathan uh, is essentially Say what you want to say about Boy Meets World, about continuality and all this other stuff. They trim the fat when they need to. <laughs> like, and it's always <laughs> the best decision possible. I think, like, I've yet, so far within our watching of it, have been like, oh, I wish they didn't cut this character. Because I don't think Minkus would fit into this world. Absolutely. I mean, again, Tawny, which is Brittany Murphy, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Jason. Like, these are characters who I love, and I love when they are on screen, but they don't, they're not given enough. And I think this episode with Eli echoes that just having a character there to have them there is not what this show's about. And, you know, to learn more about Eli and Jonathan is not to learn more about Sean, to learn more about Verna, to learn more about Chet, to learn to see Sean try to, like, glue this family together is fascinating. Let's dive into it. But again, I think that I'm arguing that they could have. They could have made the adventures of Jonathan and Eli be a foreshadowing or a... um guidepost for Corey and Eric. You know, like, let's see them date in a way that's not sitcom Let's see them have a fight that the boys And have you to... know what? You can tell that the writers were like, 
wanting to do something with that, couldn't find the opportunities. But once the college years come around, they're like, okay, now let's let's ha- let's do all of those storylines exactly. that we wanted to do before. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So I mean, we go back to the same apartment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have there... a bra moment? Um. I, again, for me, I think it's just it's not like uh, I know you have one. But for me, my bra moment wasn't more of a distant hold up. It was more of a actually, you know, what? I take that back because what I was going to say is uh, Chet being so honest and direct. I was like, whoa, you know, it was just like yeah. again, you don't get a character who's just like, I don't want my kid. I don't sure, know what to tell yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell my kid, I said, hey, again, stuff like that. But uh, also, I was a little thrown off with the. B storyline with Eric, like just having a girl thrown at him. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. You know, I always I'm like, what what world are we living in? But okay, moving forward. Uh, I have a bra moment in which uh, <laughs> Corey brings Topanga of all people who we haven't seen or heard of. She has no real agency. Yeah. Um, Topanga to this rest stop. This yep. Um, to uh, meet Chet. While he's there, Corey is approached by a woman in a bar. I believe we said her name was Luann. Luann. And Luann says, in so many words, I'm going to make my boyfriend jealous by dancing up on some other guy. Corey <laughs> walks in, she's like, hey, this is a 15-year-old kid, this is cool. And begins dancing and doing all these things. And I know people are going to say, oh, it's just funny, it's just a sitcom, whatever. But I truly want you to watch how they dance, and then I want you to think, if Jonathan was dancing with Topanga in that same way to make another female jealous, would it make you feel weird? I think every time you do this, I love it because it's like, all right, let, if we change the genders, if we if we just make this a Turner and Topanga situation, is it just as funny? If your answer is no, then it's not funny. It's creepy, <laughs> yeah. And that's and I think that like there was just so much of this um in entertainment growing up where like if a guy hooked up with an if an underage guy hooked up with an older woman he had game absolutely whereas the other way around was just you know a, a scarlet letter waiting to happen so i was watching this uh or listening to this podcast on um this old movie i say old but it's like 2000s uh my best friend's girl okay with dane cook have you ever yeah, seen I've it heard or heard about this. it yes and they were just talking about how like just atrocious and like this the whole setup is it's a dane cook movie it's a dane cook movie and it's just all patriarchy and like one of the lines in it that's supposed to be funny is kate hudson goes to him she's like i practically roofied myself and you didn't do anything and everyone's like what Uh, like why why a why and then b that's not funny like that's not comedy like what are we doing here what are we teaching boys with this yeah, I just I really want to examine this at a boy vibe that we're throwing around, especially in this older content that we all kind of grew up with. And now, like, we reflect on things, oh, this art was so cool. But, like, just that's the whole point of this podcast is to kind of comb a, a, a brush through it and be like, mm, there's some lice in here. I mean, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that analogy. It's so good for you. Right. Especially school. 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 Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, lesson. Lesson, um, uh, I think it's just to, like, to take the leap, I guess. Yeah, I was gonna say stop running. Yeah, stop running. Face it. Yeah, I think that's really, well, I don't know if that's the, th- I think that's definitely the theme for Chet, but I can't say that that's well, the theme I would for... say I would say that's pretty much the theme for, like, for me, both Jonathan and, uh, Sean, equally, they have to, it's something that's been on the back corner, they've been avoiding it. You know what I mean? And it's just yeah. like, everyone in this episode has to like just stop and really address the thing that's kind of been going on in the background. It's almost like the whole theme of the show, okay, I'm going to think <laughs> uncertainty. <laughs> uncertainty with Chet, Sean, Jonathan, and even Eric yeah. having uncertainty if he was going to be successful in his pursuits. Yeah. And facing it head on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that's, that, to me, that's a lesson. Uh, great. What are you giving this? I'm gonna give this episode a B plus. Like I said, I think it's just a very important episode to the series, and uh, we're yeah. on the same page. B plus. It's, it's. I think we're just gonna start getting better episodes going forward. That's so. fantastic. Okay. Um. That brings us to our homework. Homework. What homework do you have for this? Um. Well, I was just. T- we just had a very detailed conversation about <laughs> uncut, uncut gems, which we saw. 
And I just would like to encourage people to go to the movies. Um, we have all of our Oscar movies are going to be coming back into the theaters. And this is just kind of your chance to catch up. I think that this movie was great. I would recommend watching it. Queen and Slim. I still want to see Honey Boy. There's just all of these like Oscar contender movies out there that I just love this time of year. Because it forces us to watch films that are more artful instead of more popcorn flicks. Um, and even shit that's like on streaming, Marriage Story and Dolomite and just these things where you're getting great performances. So. I think I've uh, mentioned this before, um, but if I haven't, I'm always like, if you have a chance and you live by an AMC, get the AMC A-list. Totally. Because it is totally worth it. We see so, like, sometimes we'll see several movies just because we can and sometimes we won't, but it's like, it's fine because we know we have the option and uh, it's $23 a month. Uh, honestly, what I love <laughs> about this is that, like, for example, I really want to see Cats. Yes. I know it's terrible, but, bro, that's the reason why I want to see it. Exactly. And I wouldn't want to spend money on it, but with AMC, I can just go to this movie, you know, sneak in my champagne, <laughs> and just, like, giggle my ass off at these furry that's cat people. exactly with Boyfriend. I said the exact same thing. I was like, do you want to see Cats? He was like, I'm not spending money on Cats. I was like, we get to see it for free. And he was like... Oh, well, then yeah, I'll go see yeah. it. Yeah, and that's my own point. Um, and also, I think, like, certain movies, watching it in the theater enhances the movie. Well, I, that's what I feel about these Oscar art house more kind of movies, is that you really need to pay attention to them uninterrupted. Like, I don't feel like Uncut Gems would have been so effective on me if I was able to take a break. It's if I was all able about to leave atmosphere. the room, to You're push right. pause. I'm in this for, like, as long as Adam Sandler is, and I'm on the edge of my fucking seat the whole time. I completely agree. Agree. You are trapped in that it's, world. You're yeah. trapped, and you hate it, but you you have to write it out. And I do think you lose something if you get to pause. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, cool. Um, my homework is a Netflix show. You a season two? So, season yep. two? Did you watch? I have not seen it yet. I watched all of it. I literally stayed up last night to, to <laughs> finish it. Um, I think it's a great follow up season. I have some problems with the. Twitter reaction because again you get all of these people who are fanboys of the main person who's basically if you haven't seen it it's about a serial killer who just gets infatuated with a specific girl each season and there are so many girls who are like there's just something about him I just I, I love him and it's just like he's a killer <laughs> like, like that's they don't even try to shy away from it they're just like no directly I kill people this is what I do for fun and Women are just some some women, not all, but like yeah, they're just like I don't know. It's just he's just cute. <laughs> I really wonder what that is. I wonder if that's taught, or I wonder if that's society. Like I, I wonder what that is. I absolutely. I was like, it's it's ridiculous. For one thing, it shows what we all know here in LA is that if you're attractive enough, you'll always have someone on your side. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're white, oh, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> you got options, fam. <laughs> All right. Um, that is our episode. Thank you guys for listening to Brum Meets World. Remember, you can find us now on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher. Make sure to leave us a rating. Um, we also recommend that you follow us at Brum Meets World or on the places and email us at brummeetsworld at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter ranting about you season two at x-e-r-a-c-e-e-j um, you can find me uh tc on instagram at the braver me at top braver dot me um you guys uh, you can also find me ringing in the new year um getting into 2020 embracing a new decade and honestly the thing i'm most excited for is that 2020 is the year we finally guys we've been waiting We've been waiting for a long time, sitting on a, just smelling all the shit that we've had to smell <laughs> for all these years to finally get to season four. Guys, it's gonna <laughs> happen. Season four coming to you in 2020. Hey yo! All right, guys, remember to drink, try, and binge season, the ending of season three. Yeah, guys, join us. Disney Plus, it's worth it. All right, uh, later, bros. Peace! <laughs>